Well, good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing today? Good, good. Uh, today is Mother's Day. It is also the seventh Sunday of Easter, and it is also a beautiful day to worship God together. I'm going to jump straight into the announcements because we have a bunch of important ones. Um, this is a pretty busy week for us. Uh, I'm going to try to do these in chronological order here, but on Tuesday, we have a potluck at Marolo Pavilion. We've already had a lot of great signups. I think we still need a couple more people to bring like chips and fruit, um, but uh, the, the potluck at Marolo, it's from 6 to 7.30. We'll have kickball, lots of food. We'll also have a fun little raffle. It's for all ages. Um, and if you have a guest or a friend that you would like to bring, they are also welcome. Um, so that is on Tuesday. On Wednesday, we have our Habitat Commencement uh, Ceremony. So Wednesday the 15th at 4.30, if you would like to come and see the erected walls and kind of celebrate with Omer and his family, um, please join on Wednesday uh, to celebrate the wall build there. Next Sunday uh, is the congregational meeting to elect the PNC. So uh, our nominating committee has been working really hard to put together our uh, pastoral search committee. And we, we have our members. Next Sunday, we need to elect them as a congregation. So please join us after the 10 a.m. worship service next Sunday uh, for our congregational meeting. Next Sunday is also Pentecost, so it's a wonderful day to wear red. And then lastly, we just have a couple of summer opportunities coming up. I know is the, the youth group, we've got our Cedar Point trip coming up at the end of May. Right at the start of June, we'll also have Vacation Bible School. If you have not signed up for Vacation Bible School, please do so soon. If you've already signed up for Vacation Bible School, think about a friend you'd like to invite and get them signed up. Um, next, we have a moment for mission from Larry McDonald to talk to us about the Pentecost special offering. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> as you know, as Nick had indicated, next Sunday is our Pentecost uh, offering. This is one of four special offerings that happen over the course of the year. Now, this one is especially a special one because 40% of the total offering will go to Salem Elementary School. Now, Jen Etsy from the administrative office has done a great job outlining kind of the history of our relationship with Salem Elementary, and it goes way back uh, to 2000, 2006 to 2007. And over that period of time, the WPC uh, Book Club uh, has been very much involved. There have been in-class uh, work from many of you that have been volunteers there. There's been Thanksgiving turkey donations. There's been the alternative Christmas, uh, providing winter coats and whatnot for the needy families there. This is a special needs uh, uh, school because 100% of all students that attend Salem Elementary are eligible for free lunches. So that's important to remember. And more importantly, about four or five years ago, the need was arose that there was uh, for the spring break uh, concerns about food insecurity, that these kids that have had the free lunch now are going to be facing uh, food uh, insecurity during the time of spring break. So again, WPC uh, responded and they were able to provide 20 bags of food for the most needy families uh, at the school. There is a family ambassador who works at Salem who knows these families very well and can pinpoint those folks that are in need. They've requested our help again. So the money that you donate will go directly to Salem School and it's located nearby. It's just off of Interstate 70, about a mile south of the Dublin Granville Road. Uh, so we can help. So this money will be used to provide uh, bags of food, and could, uh, which would include food staples, uh, healthy snacks for the kids, and a Kroger, Kroger gift card. So together, we can do it. These children, all children, need to have our love, our nurturing, and our support. And thank you in advance for your generosity. 
Thank you very much, Larry. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and also with you. Let us stand and share a sign of Christ's peace with one another. Please join me in our opening sentences. O oh Lord, you have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by the strength to your holy abode. Lead us today into your presence that we may worship you in holiness. Amen.
Thank you. Today is the seventh Sunday of Easter. It is the seventh week in a row where we celebrate um, Christ's sacrifice. Um, not only thinking about the crucifixion and his sacrifice for us, but also his resurrection. It is to this Christ that we can confess our sins knowing that he lived as we lived and who suffered and struggled just as we suffered and struggled. Let us pray together the prayer of confession that is within our bulletin. O oh, Father, we are gathered before you, the maker of heaven and earth, whose chosen dwelling place is with the broken and contrite, to confess that we have sinned in thought and word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart, so we have not loved you with all our mind and strength. We have not even loved our neighbor as ourselves. Purge us from selfishness, the fear of man, and the love of praise. In your mercy, deepen our sorrow for the wrong we have done and for the good we have left undone, so that we may hate our sin with a holy hatred. But please, Father, do not leave us in sorrow. With you, O Lord, there is forgiveness. In your mercy, restore the joy of our salvation so that we may love you with a holy love. Amen. At Easter, we are reminded that nothing, not even sin and death, can separate us from the love of God. Brothers and sisters, know that you are forgiven. Amen. You may be seated. And could I have all the children coming up? All right, come have a seat here. Wonderful. All right, this is not the first time I've been asked to do the children's message on Mother's Day, despite me not being a mother. But I always love to share about um, good Bible stories with mothers in them. <gasps> Thank you, Amy. <laughs> awesome. Well, today I want to share a Bible story, a favorite of mine, that includes not only one mother, but two mothers, and two very, very different mothers. It also includes a very evil king. So a long time ago, over 3,000 years ago, there was a mother who had a baby boy. And she lived in this country far away called Egypt. And she had this baby boy, but the ruler of Egypt at the time was this very evil king. And his name was Pharaoh. We can call him Pharaoh. And Pharaoh 
enslaved this mother and her whole family and her whole people. And Pharaoh decided that he didn't want this mother to have that baby boy. And so what did mom do? Mom knew that his baby boy was in danger of being taken away from her. And so she took him to the river. She put him in this waterproof basket and she sent him into the river so that the evil king could not find the baby boy. Well, interestingly enough, later that day, Pharaoh's daughter, the daughter of this evil king, came down to the river and saw a little baby there um, in a basket. And she decided to take him out of the basket. And seeing that he had no one to take care of her, she took him into her family and she became his mother. And I really like that story for several reasons. But the first is that being a mother is very difficult. We have kind of the story of two mothers, one mother who knew she had to give up her baby to save her baby. And then we had another woman who was not this baby's mom directly, but who took this baby who needed a mother and became this baby's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter named that baby Moses. And Moses was the one that God would use in order to free uh, God's people from slavery in Egypt. And so I really like that story as we think about our own mothers, but not only our own mothers, but also just the women in our lives who have given of themselves to be motherly to us, who have embraced us, who've helped us to grow and to nurture us. Um, I love this story because being a mom isn't easy. And there are also many women in our lives who have been like mothers to us, and we need to be grateful for all of them. And so today, I want you to not only think about your own mom and to thank her, but also to think about kind of all the other women in your lives who have given up themselves in order to help you guys out. All right, let us pray. Dear Lord, today we want to thank you for the gift of mothers. Lord, we want to thank you for Moses' mom and also Pharaoh's daughter who helped Moses grow up to be uh, the man that you would call him to be. Um, Lord, we have so many women who have poured into our lives and who've helped shaped us um, to be who you want us to be. God, help us to remember and thank our mothers this day. Amen. All right, you guys are going to follow Annie to Sunday school, and if you're in sixth and seventh grade, I'm taking you downstairs. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. How many baby boomers do we have in this group? Could you raise your hands? Quite a few. Bill, raise your hand. You're a baby boomer, okay. <laughs> do you remember <clears throat> when you were growing up and went to church that your mother always wore a hat? Do you remember what a hat is? Okay. And, and what I remember is my mother told me that when I grew up, that I could wear a hat every Sunday to church. What happened? <laughs> uh, the hat this morning is an honor and remembrance of my wonderful mother. These verses from the prophet Jeremiah remind us why we worship God. We do not worship God out of obligation as one is obligated to complete a chore. We worship God in the splendor of his greatness and might. 
We worship God who alone deserves and receives our worship. There is indeed none like God. Let us pray. Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit, illumine the sacred page, we pray, that our minds may be open to receive your word, our hearts taught to love it, and our wills strengthened to obey it. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Listen to God's word from Jeremiah 10, 6 to 7. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O King of nations? For this is your due. For among all the wise ones of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. The word of the Lord.
Our second reading this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 5, verses 7 to 8, as we continue to make our way through the Beatitudes. Listen to God's word. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. It's the word of the Lord. God. I'm certain you'd all agree with me that mercy is a good thing, especially when it involves, well, us, right? <laughs> we like receiving mercy. We like receiving mercy in place of what we know we deserve. Mercy's a good thing. We value it. We we rejoice in it as long as we don't have to live it towards others. That's the challenge, isn't it? It is one thing to rejoice in the mercy we receive. It's quite another and perhaps even a great challenge to live mercy towards others. And so we come upon this beatitude. Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Likewise, I'm sure you would all agree with me that purity is a good thing, especially in the products that we buy. When we go to uh, Kroger's or Giant Eagle or wherever we might do our shopping, that we'd like to know that the food we're buying is pure, right? We don't want to get sick by the food that we purchase. Purity is an important thing. And yet here, it's talking about purity of heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. What is it pure in heart? What does that mean? How is it present in our lives? What does it mean to live the blessing of mercy, not simply to receive it, but have it flow from our lives? So as we remain seated with the crowd around Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, there on that green grass, on that hill, with the Sea of Galilee behind us, looking out probably on a day like today, sunshine and beauty. And we hear these words, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive, shall receive mercy. And yet, as we look around those people around us sitting there listening to Jesus' teaching, we understand that they were living in a merciless world, that mercy was the exception to the rule. They were under the heel of the Roman Empire, and the Romans didn't care about how the Jewish people live. They didn't care at all about their uh, laws and regulations and about their culture. The only thing they were concerned about was maintaining their order and power. And if they had to be merciless to do that, they were more than willing. In fact, it was the policy of the Roman Empire. The Pax Romana was to level your enemies, was to go in and... Uh, destroy those who opposed you and make them an example to others. Mercy, where is it in their lives? And they also had to contend with their daily lives. There was no safety net in the world in which they lived, or if it was, it was a very small safety net dependent upon the synagogue and, and family. If you found yourself in a debt you could not pay back, there was no bankruptcy protection. All your belongings could be sold by your creditor, and you could be sold as well, you and your family, and become enslaved by the person to whom you owed that money. Mercy in a world where it is lacking. And we look out at our culture today, we, we see a lack of mercy. We hear in the headlines, of wars and rumors of wars. We hear about crime. We hear about culture. We do not have to contend with the uh, violence of the Roman Empire making examples out of us, but we do wonder about things like crime and 
and so on. And into that context, out of the context in which Jesus was preaching to these people, come these words. Blessed are the merciful. What is mercy? In its simplest definition, mercy is simply receiving, or not receiving, I should say, not receiving what is clearly deserved. Not receiving what is clearly deserved. And that's the challenge for us, isn't it? We like it when, and we rejoice when we don't receive what we deserve, but that other person who goes flying by us on the interstate and we see that person pulled over by a cop two miles down the road, isn't there just a sense of rejoicing? <laughs> he got what he deserved. Now, of course, you may have been speeding yourself, not receiving what is deserved. And then living mercy when someone hurts us, depending on the depth of that hurt, it's difficult to be merciful. And that's the challenge, isn't it, in living this mercy. We should rejoice when we receive it. It is a gift from God. God has not given us what we deserved. Instead, he has given us Christ who has gone to the cross, taking upon himself what you and I deserve so that we can receive mercy and forgiveness. And in that, this Easter season, we rejoice every day of our lives, not just this season of Easter. And yet, that mercy that is present in our lives and our relationship with God flows into our lives and flows out of our lives. And that's the challenge, isn't it? Living that mercy towards others. And the deeper someone has hurt us, the more difficult it is. We may, we may think that it's naive to try to live this way. You can't conduct business that way. You can't, you can't be merciful in your conduct with someone who has wronged you. Or can you? I believe we can. I don't think Jesus ever uh, uttered an idle word that could not be applied to our lives. And remember, these are not goals towards which we strive. Rather, this is a reality of our redemption that we live. And so they can be a challenge. And living mercy means taking a step back at times. We may think that mercy negates the pursuit of justice because justice comes with penalties at times. So how is it that we as the people of God can live this mercy that is present in our lives, let it flow from our lives into the lives of others, and yet at the same time insist upon justice? At times that's difficult. And it requires taking a step back and reflection and thinking. Remember, Jesus did not call us to an easy life. He called us to a faithful life. And at times, that faithfulness and living our faith requires that justice. So how might we live mercifully toward others and yet also pursue justice. Those two things can walk side by side, hand in hand. They can welcome one another. When I was in high school, I knew a family who uh, had a vacation home up on the St. Lawrence Seaway in upstate New York. They began by buying an old caboose, an old red caboose, putting it on their property. That was their first vacation home. He had taken great care in actually laying a railroad bed the length of the, uh, of the car, had the car brought in by crane, set on those uh, tracks, and to keep it from rolling, welded the wheels to the tracks. It wasn't going anywhere. It had a cupola on the top, the old cupola, 
where you could sit and eat your meals and look out over the river. It was a beautiful thing. Later on, they managed to uh, build an A-frame a little bit further down, closer to the river. It was a gathering spot for their family and for their friends. It was one of those oases in their lives that they were able to live and enjoy. And then they got a call one day that some teenagers had broken into their house, had damaged it, uh, had uh, taken some things, breaking and entering. What were they to do? The prosecutor called them. We have these kids. What do you want to do? Do you want to pursue charges? Now, the first reaction, and maybe some of you felt it, the first reaction was, yes, these kids need to learn a lesson. They need to respect other people's property. Maybe a few days in juvie hall would be good for them. They need to make restitution and pay us back. That was clearly an option. His family said, no, we're not going to do that. They thought about it. People of faith prayed about it. The question was, how can they pursue justice and also live mercy? And so they got in touch with the prosecutor and said, here's, here's what we would like to do. First, the kids, the teenagers, have to take responsibility for what they did. They have to admit and accept that responsibility. Second, no jail time. They need to uh, be sentenced to community service, most of which would be spent working with the father of this family, repairing the damage that they had done, and paying for the supplies that were needed to fix the damage. Prosecutor agreed. The family and their parents, the, the boys and their parents agreed. The judge agreed. And so they spent several hours working with this man. They could see the hurt that they had caused. They could repair the damage they had done and make restitution that way. They could take responsibility for what they did and yet at the same time receive mercy. And several hours with this man, that was a good thing. Mercy and justice can exist side by side, but it takes, it takes time, it takes stepping back, that immediate reaction. Because what we want to do is, is get even. That's the difference between justice and revenge. Revenge, we want to make that person pay. Revenge, we want to have them suffered at least as much as we suffered, preferably more. Justice says no. It's about doing what is right. It is about living the mercy and pursuing what is right, living the mercy that we have received from God himself. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Grammar time, that word in the original language is a future passive verb for you uh, grammar files which means it's a future thing. They will be shown or they shall receive mercy. Now, they've already received mercy from God. The idea is that they are living the mercy that they have received, richly poured into their lives by God, and are receiving that mercy when they stand before God as well. When they hear, well done, well done. Blessed indeed are the merciful, who understand the mercy that they have received from God, who seek and pray and think about what it means to live that mercy towards everyone. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. What image pops into your head when you think of the pure in heart? You think about somebody who's always good, 
never in trouble, always kind of doing the right thing. You might think of a, somebody way up there, like, I don't know, Mother Teresa, who gave up her life to work with the poor. Now she was pure in heart. What does it mean, pure in heart? Again, remember, this is not a goal toward which we aim our lives and seek to attain by our own efforts. This is a reality within our lives, that having been forgiven, we are pure in God's sight, and so we live that. To be pure, the word carries the meaning of authenticity, it carries the meaning of an authentic faith, that uh, the faith that you see on the outside of that person's life is what reflective of the reality inside that person's heart. And we've all known individuals who, to whom we can ask a question, we can approach, and we know that their faith is real and authentic, that if we ask them what they're thinking, they will tell us with mercy. They will tell us. They will be truthful. They will be honest. Not because these are the things, the good things that get people into heaven. Remember, it's not about living a good life. It's about living a faithful life. We cannot be good enough to make our way into heaven. We can only receive that reconciliation by faith alone. And so that authentic faith, that purity, it's a pure faith. We have a... Uh, we, do you have a, well, maybe you do, maybe you don't. We have a Berkey. Do you know what a Berkey is? I see a couple of nuts. A Berkey is like a water purifier. Put water in the top, it goes through, takes everything except the water out of the water. <laughs> it purifies the water. God's grace comes into our lives and purifies our heart, sets us in the right direction so that we live this authentic, pure faith. It doesn't mean we never have a question, and it certainly does not mean that we do not struggle from time to time in our faith. But we seek to be faithful. We live that faith. We hold on to it. It's real for us. Even in those times when we can't quite make sense of what's going on, when we have questions and doubts, we all do. And we know that in that purity of faith, in that purity of heart, we can come before God and tell him honestly we're struggling or that we don't understand what is happening or rejoice in his rich forgiveness that we enjoy in our lives. Purity of heart, authentic faith, a pure faith that what you see in a person's life on Sunday morning gathered with others for worship is the same person on Monday morning in that business meeting making that difficult decision, wanting to do what is right and merciful and good and just. So how do we get there? Well, it's a lifelong process in our lives, that our faith is never stagnant, that it's always moving forward. It's always developing as we learn new things about how to live, live a life that brings honor to God in our, in our day-to-day -day living. I knew someone uh, a few pastorates ago who had an ultrasound of their heart. And they could see, they could see inside this person's heart. They could see, no, I'm not in medicine, and that's a good thing, um, many people are alive because of that. <laughs> but they could see the valves of the heart. You, they could see the heart pumping. They could see all the functions of the heart right in there. And that's what we, we need to ask God to do an ultrasound of our hearts, to show us what is there, to, to lead us in pursuing purity of heart and faith which is a lifelong process and commitment. And so we ask God in reflection and in prayer to do the ultrasound of our spiritual hearts, what is there. And that takes time. One of our things about culture is that we're so busy, we're always in a rush. 
And we need to take that time to step back in quietness, to reflect upon our faith and upon what God has done and is doing in our lives, to ask for ongoing, continued mercy and grace. We're going to be taking a break from our Beatitudes as we go into uh, Pentecost and celebrate Pentecost. And so let us remember where we are. Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, benevolent, humane, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. God is good. Amen. Please be seated. Anxious prayers ascend to heaven. The young mother depends on God to nurture the life she's been given. When the mother hears the first cry, the tiny child claims her heart. A bound that cannot be broken. Deep, passionate love from the start. Happy Mother's Day to all mothers. Now let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we have so many prayers. There are so many things for which 
we long, things we hope for, things we are working for, and things we cannot do alone. Thank you for your presence in this place of worship. We come before you with humble hearts and ask that you grant us mercy and forgiveness for our shortcomings. We give thanks and celebrate the birthdays of Lois, Beth, and Bill, and Rodney's 97th birthday today, and Bill's 98th birthday later this week. We pray for all people who are sick and struggling with illness of any kind, whether it is cancer, addiction, or mental health challenges. We pray that your healing power will surround and support and heal all people. We pray for Jim Wilson to recover from mild stroke. Dear Lord, we come before you today to lift the pastoral nominating committee, grant them discernment and wisdom as they seek to identify the shepherd you have chosen for your flock. May they be guided by your Holy Spirit in every discussion and decision, and may your hearts, may, and may their hearts be aligned with your will. We lift the children who do not have safe and loving families. Many endure unexplicable harm and neglect at the hands of those who should love and protect them. They witness domestic violence, drug abuse, mental illness, and other form of adversity that cause lifelong harm if we do not intervene. Dear God, grant safety and healing to these children and families. We pray for people who struggle with poverty and stable housing. Often these individuals are cast aside and blamed for their condition. Give us, O oh Lord, generous hearts and kind minds to find solution for these issues and tangible share your love. As we celebrate our Mother's Day, dear Lord, we pray for mothers, fathers, grandparents who struggle to help family members suffering from addiction, mental illness, or other serious problems. Open our eyes for these needs around us and help us better serve those in need. Father, we lay these burdens and those not spoken before you. The great I am, the ultimate healer, in you all things are possible. God of mercy and love, hear our prayers, open our hearts, and heal our brokenness. To you we pray. Now, let us pray the, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Amen. Let us present our tithes and offerings.
Now let us pray to God as we pre present our offering. Father, as we lay before you our financial offering, we give, all, we give you all that we are and everything that you have entrusted to us. Come, bless these gifts for the sake of your kingdom and glory. Amen. And now may the grace and mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit fill your lives now and forevermore through Jesus Christ, our risen and living Lord. Happy Mother's Day.